Hello everyone. I have no idea what time it is where you are, but I'm recording this video in the evening, so good evening, or nos to any Welsh people out there. I'm Steve from the Church of God in Aberkenfig, a small village not too far from Cardiff, the Welsh capital city. My topic today is titled A Prisoner for the Lord, a phrase some may recognise straight away. If you don't, that's okay. You'll know it when I get to that point in my talk. Our virtual church services in Aberkenfig have recently had a section examining the life of Joseph. He was a young man sold into slavery by his older brothers and taken to Egypt where he ran Potiphar's household until one day he was thrown into prison. An unfounded charge of attempted rape had been levelled against him by Potiphar's wife who had been continually attempting to seduce him. He rejected every attempt, but Potiphar believed his wife when she made her accusation against Joseph. So without trial, Joseph ended up in Pharaoh's prison, where he was left to rot. But the Lord was with him. He ensured that the prison warden favoured Joseph. He put him in charge of all the other prisoners presumably while he himself took it easy. But let's understand that this was no easy life for Joseph. An innocent young man thrown into prison for no justifiable cause had every right to be angry. But when in the future an opportunity for revenge came against his brothers, a time to pay them back for what they had done to him, he didn't seek revenge. Instead he saw the bigger picture the reason why God had allowed him to be sold into slavery and then imprisoned. He said to them, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You know, sometimes life is tough. It can seem to deal with us unfairly and we suffer without cause. But God always has a purpose that is being fulfilled even while we suffer. We won't know what it is at the time. Our suffering may be so great we don't even care. But in a future day the Lord will show us what he was doing and why it had to hurt so much. We'll appreciate afresh that all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Through Joseph we also learn something about the Lord Jesus. He too was rejected by his own. John's Gospel tells us he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. That's so sad, but it didn't stop him from loving them and dying for them. He died for us too. And John's Gospel continues by saying, Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In a world filled with people who don't seem to know who they are anymore, who struggle with their identity asking, who am I? What's the point of my life? There's no greater joy than being able to say you're a child of God. You belong to him and your life's purpose is serving him. It's the path to fulfillment in this life and eternal joy ahead. The Apostle Peter also spent time in prison and we read about his experience in Acts 12. His fellow Apostle James had already been put to death by sword during a period of persecution and now it was Peter's turn. Herod had him imprisoned and watched continually by four squads of four soldiers each with the intention of dealing with him after Passover. The guard was ridiculous when you consider he was just a Bible preacher and teacher. But it goes to show the power of the gospel and how dangerous they thought it was. And of course, this is the same power that is at our disposal, even in coronavirus days. The gospel is immune to COVID-19. Peter's story also shows us the power of fervent collective prayer because church members were gathered together while he was in prison, praying for him, and their prayers were answered to their own surprise. With angelic help, Peter was freed from prison and went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. 
Rhoda, a servant girl, answered the door when he knocked. But no one gathered for prayer in that home believed her when she said that Peter was outside, waiting at the door. It makes me wonder what they've been praying for. Peace in his heart, freedom from fear, the saving of his life, a prayer that he wouldn't deny the Lord this time. Who knows? Did they perhaps underestimate what God could do? Because we often do. It's so easy to forget that our God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Maybe when we pray we need to let our imaginations run riot and never limit God by the shallowness of our prayers. Think big and pray big. There's no prayer too great that God cannot answer if it conforms to his will. Then we move on to the Apostle Paul, who tells us himself that he'd often been in prison, a repeat offender, although always innocent of any crime. It's also Paul who called himself a prisoner for the Lord. The first time we read of him in prison was while he was at Philippi, where both he and Silas were imprisoned in an inner cell with their feet placed in stocks, presumably the treatment reserved for hardened criminals. Their crime was freeing someone from demonic control. Being locked up for setting someone free, what a terrible crime. While in prison, there was an earthquake. The prison jailer assumed prisoners had escaped and was about to kill himself. When Paul assured him everyone was still there, that night the jailer and his household found faith in Christ. He had asked, what must I do to be saved? And received the wonderful answer, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. We love this story because it's dramatic and gives us a great verse on which we can hang our preaching. But let's not overlook the fact that this is another occasion when God took his men into a situation they could never have envisaged, wouldn't have wanted but God used it for good, to bring glory to himself and salvation to men. Dates are uncertain because we have to look at extra biblical knowledge, but it appears that Paul's service for, for the Lord lasted for about 30 years, with between five or six of those years being spent in prison. That's somewhere between 17 to 20 percent of his active service time in prison. Some of that was under house arrest, but it was still under lockdown, to use a phrase we know so well. He still had his movements restricted and couldn't go where or do what he wanted. He just had to wait for people to come to him and take messages to others. It's so restrictive. And what could he do in those prison years? Well, for a start, he wrote four letters that are well known to us. While in prison in Rome, he wrote letters to the Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians and a shorter letter to Philemon. And in doing so, he gave the Christian church some wonderful, rich teaching. In Ephesians, for example, he tells us of the spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ. Unity in the body of Christ and the armour of God. In Philippians, he encourages us to imitate Christ, to have his mind. And we have that wonderful doxology that shows the humility of Christ, who made himself to be nothing, and ends with him being highly exalted and given the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He also tells us what life is all about. It's to know Christ and to consider everything a loss for the surpassing greatness of knowing him. As for Colossians, we read about the supremacy of the Son of God, achieving spiritual fullness in Christ and how to live as those who have been made alive in Christ, where the peace of God is to rule in our hearts. Such amazing teaching in all three letters, written while Paul was in prison. He kept going despite 
his circumstances. Paul was able to see beyond the present to recognize that God was still at work in his life and others. To the Philippian church he wrote, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. I can imagine they had to keep changing the guards as Paul led one after another to the Saviour. He may have been in prison, but he was in the right place at the right time to lead souls to Christ. Did you notice when Paul said, I have been chained for Christ? He said something similar in Ephesians, where he described himself as an ambassador in chains. No diplomatic community for him then. I've often heard Paul described as the greatest Christian who's ever lived. Apart from greatest Christian being an oxymoron, I think Paul would be horrified to be so called. In addition to saying he was a prisoner for the Lord and an ambassador in chains, he also said he was less than the least of all saints and a chief of sinners. This was a humble man who didn't aspire to be the greatest Christian. And he reminds us that humility in service is essential, that we are to be like our master who humbled himself to death. While in prison, wherever he was, Paul faithfully proclaimed the gospel whenever opportunity arose. Felix, Festus, Agrippa, Bernice, they all heard the gospel. Paul couldn't stop speaking of his Lord. Another wonderful example for us to follow. Keep speaking of him. Be bold and never be ashamed or embarrassed. We have to sow the word of God in people's hearts if we or someone else is to reap. In Matthew 28, the Lord Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. At the conclusion to the book of Acts, we're told that Paul proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Despite his strange circumstances, Paul was a faithful disciple, doing as his Lord commanded and doing it with boldness. We're passing through strange circumstances right now because of COVID-19. Worse in some parts of the world than others, but disruptive to all. I hope disruptive doesn't mean we're unable to do anything right now when we consider our service for the Lord. Disruptive didn't stop Paul. It's perhaps true that there's little we can do as churches in some cases, and without technology it may have been nothing at all. But we must all consider how we can, as individuals, continue to preach and teach. Using technology or not, how can we share Christ with our communities? Paul's life was severely disrupted, but not his service. Wherever he was, whatever his circumstances, he preached and taught to the glory of God, and may we do likewise. I'm almost finished, but I have a couple of points to make. Joseph, Peter, Paul, Silas too. They all ended up in prison despite their innocence. In varying degrees, they suffered at the hands of men. The Bible says that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. And so it must be if men who are known to be innocent of any crime are treated so badly. Servants of God suffer and Satan rejoices. It still happens across the world today where person of Christians is taking place. And we must remember our brothers and sisters who have committed no crime. They just love the Lord. Let's keep bringing them before the throne of grace. Four innocent men suffered. They remind us of another innocent man who suffered more than the four put together. 
This man didn't even get the luxury of a night in a prison cell. Although no accusation brought against him was found to be true, he was cruelly treated before being executed. Who is this man? Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53 tells us that he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He was perfect in every way, but still he was despised and rejected by mankind. Adored in heaven by the angelic hosts, on earth he was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and held in low esteem. Why was this? Why did he have to suffer in this way? Why the rejection? Isaiah 53 once again tells us, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us is turned to his, his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord Jesus bore the punishment that was rightfully ours to bring peace and healing, to deal with the sin that isolated us from God, and still does if we don't know the Lord Jesus as our Saviour. The immensity of his suffering is beyond our understanding. So too is the love that brought him from heaven to earth to endure it. But just because we can't understand it, doesn't mean it's not true. It is a truth beyond question that the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, loves us and gave himself for us. Rejoice in your salvation. It was brought to you at great cost. Willingly give back to the Lord all you have and are. It's the very least you can do. Perhaps you don't yet know the Lord Jesus as your Saviour. Do you remember earlier when I mentioned Paul and Silas being in prison and their jailers saying, what must I do to be saved? The answer was very clear. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. No ifs or buts, no qualifying statements. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's how sin can be forgiven. And how you can know peace and healing in your life. It's through the Lord Jesus and him only. Believe and you will be saved. Thank you for giving me your time. May God bless you. 